Hi everyone, in this lecture we will be talking about neuronal communication or the process of how different neurons transmit signals. In this figure, we can see the different parts of our neuron. First you have the cell body which controls the entire neuron and it also is the one that receives the different signals from other neurons or from other cells. Extending from the cell body are various dendrites, and there is one extension which we call the axon, which is incredibly long in comparison to the rest of the body. It can be as much as one meter in length in some parts of the human body. At the end of this axon, we have the nerve terminal, which is used to communicate to other cells or other neurons. Now, the different neurons in our body can all communicate with each other through the means of a neural circuit. This is akin to the electrical circuit that we have in the real world. So just like in the real world, where you have different wires that connect our homes and our houses and passes electricity among those different buildings, in the body, we have a collection of neurons which are all interconnected to each other. And in order to talk to one another, they pass what we call action potentials or nerve impulses. These are long distance electrical signals that can move very fast, up to 100 meters per second. In this figure, we can see an example of an action potential. The action potential is just actually a rapid change in the membrane potential of the neuron. So we can see that it goes from negative to positive and then back to negative. This is a process which we call depolarization. And the action potential is triggered by depolarization of the cell membrane. So you can see here that at rest, our cell membrane still has a very negative potential, but as it becomes stimulated, it starts to depolarize. Now at a certain point, which we call the threshold potential, this depolarization suddenly increases. And this is because there is a sudden influx of sodium ions into the cell. So it rapidly increases from negative and it becomes positive. Now the action potential is triggered by a protein which we call the voltage-gated sodium ion channel. In the cell's resting state, this channel is normally closed, but because it is voltage-gated, it can sense changes in the membrane potential of the cell, and when depolarization happens, it is triggered and it opens. This allows for the sudden influx of sodium ions into the cell. After a while though, this protein undergoes a refractory period in which it automatically shuts off, and this occurs approximately one millisecond after it opens. By doing this, it prevents additional sodium ions from coming into the cell. In this figure, you can see a combination of the different conformations of our sodium channel and the membrane potential. So we can see the relationship between the two. While the cell or the neuron is still at rest, we can see that the sodium channel is still closed, but at the threshold potential, or meaning as the cell becomes more and more positively charged, the sodium channels suddenly open and change the membrane potential from negative to positive. But after a while, the sodium channels inactivate themselves and this prevents additional sodium from coming inside the cell. And this gives the cell time to reset itself. The other proteins that return the membrane potential to its resting state are the sodium potassium pumps and the potassium leak channels, which we discussed in our previous lecture. So something that we need to understand is that our action potential actually spreads across the axon. It does not appear all of a sudden in all places of our neuron. Instead, it goes from one end to the other. So it slowly moves its way across the axon until it gets to the terminal end. Now the reason why action potential spreads gradually throughout our axon is because the entirety of the axon is actually covered by our sodium channels. And depolarization or changes in the membrane potential only occur in one region at a time. So in this figure, we can see this region being depolarized and as it becomes more positively charged, this set of sodium channels open. And in doing so, it creates a positive charge in this area, and this is the one that depolarizes the next sodium channels in the line, and so on and so forth. 
So here we can see that this part is being depolarized. And after that, this next part of your axon becomes depolarized. In doing so, our action potential spreads from one part of the axon to the other. Until such time, the electrical signal reaches the nerve terminals at the end of the neuron. In between our different neurons are actually junctions, which we call synapses. Here we can see two cells that are meeting. First, we have the presynaptic cell, which is a cell transmitting the electrical signal. On the opposite end, you have a receiving cell, which we call the postsynaptic cell. And in between them, you have a gap, which we call the synaptic cleft. Now the problem is, how does the presynaptic cell transmit an electrical signal across this gap? In order to do this, it has to first convert the electrical signal into a chemical signal. And it's actually the chemicals that moved in this gap and are detected by your postsynaptic cell. The specific chemicals used in this instance are what we call neurotransmitters. In a nerve terminal, we have what we call synaptic vesicles, which contain our different neurotransmitters. These vesicles are attached to the cell membrane of our terminal, and they are just waiting to be released into the synaptic cleft. The way that they are released is through the use of another voltage-gated channel, which we call the voltage-gated calcium channel. So as the action potential reaches the nerve terminal, it activates these calcium channels, and they allow for the entry of extracellular calcium inside our nerve terminal. When this happens, there is depolarization, and this causes the fusion of synaptic vesicles to the cell membrane. And in turn, this releases neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Now, on the opposite side of the cleft, we have our postsynaptic cell, which contains a neurotransmitter receptor. These are proteins whose job it is to detect these different neurotransmitters. Coincidentally, these proteins are also, in and of themselves, transmitter-gated ion channels. This means that when they detect the neurotransmitter, they can actually open up and allow the entry of our different ions, which you can see in this part of the figure here. As the ions enter the cell, there is depolarization that occurs, and as a result, there is a spread of action potential. So our neurons have just converted an electrical signal from the presynaptic cell into a chemical signal which is transmitted here in the synaptic cleft, and in turn, this chemical signal is detected by the postsynaptic cell, and that postsynaptic cell converts it back into an electrical signal. In this slide, we can see examples of the different types of neurotransmitters found in the human body. The first class of neurotransmitters are called excitatory neurotransmitters. And some examples we have here are acetylcholine and glutamate. The receptor in charge of detecting these transmitters are what we call ligand-gated cation channels. This means that when they detect the neurotransmitter, they open up and allow cations to enter the cell. As a result, they cause depolarization of the cell. On the opposite side, we have inhibitory transmitters. Some examples we have are gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, and glycine. The receptor responsible for detecting these neurotransmitters are what we call chlorine ligand gated channels. And instead of allowing cations to enter the cell, when they detect the inhibitory neurotransmitters, they instead allow anions, in this case chlorine, to enter the cell. As the chlorine concentration of the cell increases, this makes it harder for the cell to be depolarized. Alright, so that's it for this lecture. If you wanted to learn more about the things that we discussed, please check out these references. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope to see you in the next lecture.